Um, so I would like to um, introduce to you the Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration from Mishawaka, Indiana. Um, hopefully I said that correctly. Um, mm -hmm. We are so happy to meet you, um, Sister Ignatia and Sister um, Regina, who are helping out right now. But keep go, feel free to introduce the sisters as we go through, Sister Ignatia. Okay, we will. So are we all set? Yes, you're okay. ready, go. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sister Ignatia. I'm the vocation director for the Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration. I'm Sister Mary Amata. I am a temporary professed sister. Uh, so, and welcome to our mother house, St. Francis Convent. Uh, so uh, I've been a part of the sisters for 10 years this year, actually. Uh, and Sister, when did you enter? I entered in 2017. So, and we're just, yeah, happy we could at least uh, invite you and welcome you this way. Um, so Sister and I have to, uh, we're just going to be masked right now. So a part of being at our mother house and being with our uh, big religious family is uh, a lot of us live together. So we just have to take a few extra precautions, keep our sisters safe. Um, you'll be able to see our beautiful smiles later. <laughs> uh, but for right now, we'll just uh, be masked. So, um, so a little bit about our community is that, um, so we, our mother but we were founded in Germany in 1863, and in 1875, uh, our first sisters uh, came to Indiana. Uh, so, and then we've been um, in Indiana and adoring Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament ever since. Uh, and then just a little bit more about our, uh, our local community. So we were founded in Germany but uh, we belong to the Immaculate Heart of Mary province. We have sisters in Germany, sisters in Colorado Springs, and sisters in the Philippines. So we are an international uh, congregation, um, but we ourselves belong to this uh, province. So a geographical area, about well, basically Indiana. Um, that is our, uh, yeah, our local community, I guess. And it's really such a gift to be under the patronage of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, especially today on the feast day, Our Lady yes. of Guadalupe. Um, just a, a huge part of our life is dedicated to Our Lady. So what we kind of have planned is to be able to share with you a walk through, through our life. So um, as Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration, our foundress from our very early days gave us um, yeah, said what our mission is, and uh, we as sisters um, strive to combine the contemplative life with the active life in perpetual adoration and the works of mercy, especially healthcare and uh, education. So uh, our sisters, sister, uh, we sponsor a hospital system, and so our sisters work in, in the hospital, many different areas. Uh, we also are in education uh, in kindergarten up through all the grades, and we also sponsor a university uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, but primarily, and why we exist, is to adore Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. So that is what we want to show you first. Um, so we're going into the very heart of our community and the very center of our mother house and our life, which is our Adoration Chapel. So. Uh, 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, there are sisters um, adoring Jesus. So right through these doors and to the right. Um, so what that means is um, we're our mother house. There's always uh, usually two sisters up um, adoring the Blessed Sacrament. So our older sisters um, who are retired from an active apostolate, they take our daytime hours and um, pray for the needs of the church in the world. And then the younger sisters um, and some of our older sisters still get up in the middle of the night and come in and adore Jesus. Um, so we yeah, sign up for those hours, um, you know, at, at free will. So that we have a little like, sign-up sheet and we just fill in our name uh, for however many hours during the week we want to, we want to take. And this is really 
um, spiritual motherhood, you know, just as a parent would wake up in the middle of the night to take care of a crying baby, we are sacrificing sleep and getting up in the middle of the night to care for the needs of the church and the world and to adore our bridegroom in the Blessed Sacrament. And so please know that we, um, a few, even like earlier this week, we added all of you vocation ministry um, just this whole day, we added that into our um, intentions in the Adoration Chapel. So, um, so know that we, our sisters have been praying for you. We will continue to pray for you. Um, and yeah, that is our best gift. Uh, that is our gift to the church, what we, um, what the Holy Spirit's asked us to do. And it's, yeah, it brings us a lot of joy to be able to, yeah, pray for you, support you in that way. Uh, and for, so now, um, usually you're, uh, we are able to keep our Adoration Chapel open from eight to eight to the, for the public. Um, but this is the best way that we can share um, our heart, our love with you. So we're going to go into the Adoration Chapel. And so usually when sisters go into the Adoration Chapel, the officers, as we call them, um, we have a little invocation that we um, say. So the new adorer comes in and says, O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. And then the adorer from the previous hour responds, um, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment of thine. So it's kind of like the, the changing of the guards. Like mm -hmm. Jesus is never alone. Uh, so we'll go in and we'll uh, say that invocation and then just spend a few minutes of silence uh, there with him. So um, yeah, I just invite you to take this time. Like Jesus doesn't want anything more from you than just you um, and your, your heart, your openness. That's why he is so available to us because he just wants to be there uh, to love us, to look at us, to gaze upon us. So whatever it is on your heart, um, just bring, bring it to him. Um, yeah, he's ready and waiting. So we'll just go and spend a few moments with him now. Sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. O praise and all thanksgiving, be every moment thine.
It just reminds me of my first time coming here to the convent when I was freshman in college. Um, I was kneeling in the adoration chapel and this prayer just sort of welled up inside me. Jesus, I desire you over and over. Jesus, I desire you. Uh, I think that's still my prayer um, in my hours of adoration. Jesus, I desire more and more of you. And I'm learning to hear him say back to me, Sister Mary Mata, I desire you. My bride, I desire you. My beloved, I desire you. Um, so it's to be able to continue to carry on the mantle of perpetual adoration in our community. It is, I think, probably our joys as sisters to be able to do that and do that together. Um, so that was the start of our spiritual kind of tour. So here's the rest of who we are as Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration. So here is our main chapel where all the sisters gather for community prayer, Liturgy of the Hours, Mass. Um, and this chapel has something very special to us um, as it has all of the uh, windows of the life of St. Joseph. So we are all as Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration, we are dedicated to St. Joseph because uh, our mother founders had a great love and devotion and trust uh, in St. Joseph. Starting a new community, you don't have maybe the things that you need, you don't have a, big, a house big enough, you don't have money, um, but she always entrusted all of her cares to St. Joseph. And on one occasion, she promised to St. Joseph, come, in, come through for me on this one. I will dedicate all of my spiritual doctrine. So, um, of course, he did. <laughs> he always comes through on his promises. And so all of us carry the title. So I am Sister Ignatia of St. Joseph, Sister Mary Mata of St. Joseph. So, and we are overjoyed that this is the year of St. Joseph. So it's very special to us. So we'll just, um, show you the, the beautiful windows. They come from our hospital in, um, in Memphis, Tennessee, that we used to have, St. Joseph Hospital. Um, so just different images of his life, the betrothal, then the nativity. The flight into Egypt, one of our personal favorites. You don't see it too often. The Holy Family. St. Joseph dying in the, in the arms of Our Lady and Jesus. And then of course, Joseph uh, glorified in heaven. And you probably can't see it, but um, underneath St. Joseph is a picture of the hospital, St. Joseph Hospital. Uh, so we always entrust all of our apostolates to him. Coming into our, our chapel, each of our sisters has their own little pew. <laughs> See all the book collection. <laughs> I just professed my first vows back in August, and in that ceremony, our parents get to walk us down the aisle. Um, so I still I'm trying to get that level as I am. Very special. Also, hi, Dad. I think he's watching. <laughs> <laughs> So it's something else very close to uh, our mother founders was our Franciscan way of life. So we are very blessed in this beautiful chapel we have uh, dedicated to our patrons and this one is dedicated to St. Francis. <laughs> uh, so in our uh, founding, uh, Mother Mary Tricia wanted um, Pope Paul to, of course, establish perpetual adoration, but also to have her sisters follow the third order rule of St. Francis. So all communities follow, there's many rules of life to follow. Um, and then based on that rule, then the, then the community writes a constitution, have the third order rule and our own constitution, um, how we live our life. And what I attracts me to um, a Franciscan way of life is of course, um, 
modeled by St. Francis and his incredible love of Jesus. Um, it was his, uh, his motivation for everything he did was, um, you know, his humility, his poverty was because Jesus was all, the, all of those things and he wanted to be as close to him as possible. Mm-hmm. And I just love Francis's totality. You know, he was all in. Um, he has this quote, hold back nothing of yourself for yourself. And he totally lived that. Even if he didn't know exactly what God meant when he said, rebuild my church, he got at it. And I hope to imitate that in my life, just that totality of gift. And then in our chapel, one of our other very special um, patrons is our own mother foundress. So uh, in 2013, our mother foundress was beatified. So um, there had been a miracle approved through her intercession. A young boy um, at the age of four had a very serious uh, virus and nothing, um, he wasn't getting better. But then uh, through um, prayer to our blessed, our blessed Mother Mary Tricia, he was cured and there was no scientific explanation for that. Uh, so then in 2013, um, in Germany, there was a big uh, ceremony for her beatification. And a lot of us who were, who were in the community at the time were able to travel to Germany, be with um, our sisters there and celebrate that uh, yeah, great event. So since then, um, we have this little shrine and in the center is um, a first class relic of our mother foundress. And I love, this is probably my favorite place in the in the main chapel to pray um the the pew is just big enough for one person and it just is looks like she's looking down on you um and you can just kind of talk to her as as you would a mother and um i just uh yeah appreciate especially her her own example of of brideship what it is to belong to jesus uh, and then just her like tenderness you know she um we have her letters uh and just how she would speak to the sisters um, you know, I can really hear her say those things to me, you know, um, and her, her motto, like he leads, I follow is so simple and to the point and, um, practical that, um, it comes to mind often that like, yeah, Jesus wills this. He wants this. He's, he's going before us. And she really emphasized sisterly love. Um, how do we love Jesus? We love Jesus and we love our sisters. Um, I just see that spirit so alive in our community. I think it was one of the things that first attracted me to this community. It's just how the sisters serve each other and how they love each other across generations. <laughs> it's beautiful to see, and it's definitely a work of grace. So this is kind of our spiritual part of the tour, and now we get to meet more of our sisters. We want to share that with you. If you've noticed, we get to pass by Jesus a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, the next place in the mother house that we're going to take you is called the Heritage Room. So it's um, where the story of our community is told. Uh, and a very special part of that is outside of that room, we have plaques uh, with lists of sisters. So every sister who has been in our congregation and who has passed away is memorialized on, on these plaques. So we get to, uh, when we pass by them, we uh, remember them and ask for the prayers. Um, yeah, it was, I think it's probably one of my favorite gifts next to perpetual adoration is that we have such a, a big history and so many sisters who have gone before us. And you know, I wouldn't be able to um, live this life or have this gift of this community without them. And um, you can definitely just see that appreciation, that love reciprocated in our older sisters. 
uh, I actually, I asked our postulant Bree um, if she had any intercessors. Um, so it's a little cold to take you out to our cemetery, but that is one of our favorite places. Um, so she was going out to the cemetery and I asked her, I was like, well, who do you stop by, you know, and ask for prayers? And she said, Sister James Agnes. I was like, oh, Sister James Agnes. She lived to be a hundred, over, <laughs> over a hundred. And when young women would visit, we would always take them to go see Sister James Agnes. So she had this one line. She always told them to go back to the wedding piece of Cana, okay? And then she had this line that she always said, do whatever he tells you, okay? And that just like struck our postulate to the heart, you know? But it was more like, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Every time. So it's great. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. We all got it. And it was just beautiful. Um, so, you know, and like for Brie, like she would, you know, she teared up, you know, when she heard those words and, you know, that's like, that's so special that we, I think we each have had that um, visiting before we enter. We always try to like visit the older sisters and they're just so like loving and they pray for, uh, pray for us and pray for us throughout our life, um, um, especially in our formation. Um, but yeah, we were just very thankful for them. So here's all the names of our um, sisters in heaven. And um, as we said, our community was founded in Germany. So some of the names sound kind of funny to us. Um, it's kind of a favorite annual pastime to tease the postulants about what kind of name they might get, um, like Sister Pompanutiana or Sister Wilgefortis. <laughs> We've had sisters with those names. So it's always lots of fun. <laughs> So this is our heritage room. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is our heritage room. Um, we start here with Mother, uh, Mother Maria Tricia. Um, and as we said, our community was founded in 1863 in Germany. Um, but not long after we were founded, there was this great persecution in Germany of the church called the Culture Comp. And actually, young women were not allowed to enter religious communities. Um, but that did not stop the Lord from calling young women to religious communities. Um, so an American bishop from Indiana um, invited Mother Maria Tricia to send sisters to his diocese. Um, so she sent these first six sisters here in 1875. Um, and they started our community here in the United States. Um, they had no money by the time they got to Indiana um, and they did not speak English, but within three weeks, they had perpetual adoration and a hospital, which is just amazing. And I think it really shows how much the father cares for our community, how he has continued to um, just guard us and guide us. Um, and you may have noticed that um, what I'm wearing looks a little different from these sisters here. Um, we call it affectionately the stovepipe habit. Um, it updated in the 1950s because the sisters actually couldn't drive in that habit because they had no peripheral vision. Um, so that's why you notice the difference. Okay. And in this corner, <laughs> we have um, just our stages of formation. So when a young woman maybe uh, does feel the Lord calling her to adore him in the Blessed Sacrament and be a member of our community. Uh, this is kind of explains the process for our sisters. So uh, there's a time of uh, candidacy when a young woman um, expresses her desire to become a sister uh, and then becomes a postulant. Um, and then your one is someone's a postulant for a year. And during that year, um, you haven't made any promises. You are living the life of the sisters um, working and praying and living with the, the novices, um, taking classes, learning about our life. And then after that first year, you become a novice. Um, you request to become a novice and receive your habit and your religious name. And you are a novice for two years. And then after uh, those two years, then you ask to vows in our community. Um, and temporary vows last for a period of five years. So from start to um, by the time you make perpetual profession is eight years. Um, so, and after perpetual profession, you receive a gold ring uh, with a cross 
on it, uh, which is directed to you to remind you of who, um, who has called you and chosen you. Um, so, and uh, any bonus points for anyone who can identify this postulate? <laughs> Don't give it away, mom. <laughs> no. So yes, 10 years ago, not mistaken. Anyway. <laughs> and um, another wonderful thing we did want to share with you um, is our sisters. So Sister Dorothy has um, agreed to share a little bit with us. She's actually um, been taught a lot of us during our formation years and um, yes, is a gift to us. So we're going to ask her a couple questions. So now we're switching to Sister Mary Amata's computer. Not bad. We good to go. It's not appearing on there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you, Sister Dorothy. Can you mute it? Yeah, go out and mute it. Uh, Sister Dorothy, <laughs> yes. could you tell me your favorite thing about religious life? Oh, my. It's the prayer. Office and mass and adoration. And it's just the prayer that we have, the prayer life. It's just being so close to Jesus right here in our mm -hmm. house. Now, how many hours of adoration do you think you you take in a day, usually? Two hours. Two. Morning and afternoon. Okay. It's not wonderful. Thank you. Uh -huh. Does it go by fast? Yes. Yes. <laughs> but I never sleep. You never sleep? No, it's not wonderful. I'm always awake. But I guess if I get up at night, I would probably sleep the whole hour. <laughs> <laughs> so... I just love being in church and going to the Lord. That is a gift. Yes, that's a great gift. Yeah. Do you have any other cherished memories from your time in community that you want to share? Oh, yes. Um, when I taught the early grades, I loved preparing second graders for first confession and first communion. Mm -hmm. Those were special moments to see the joy in the little kids. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, now, most of my life lately has been working with young sisters, mm -hmm. teaching the analysis of postulates, <laughs> mentoring a couple yeah. of the junior sisters, and just being around them. They're so life giving. Mm -hmm. They keep me young. <laughs> You're life giving to us, too, Sister Dorothy. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Would you be willing to stick around for a little question and answer? Sure. You want to stick around? Sure. Yeah, I think well, we're yeah. ready. We're ready for questions now, if that's okay. I think we'll do some. Yes. yes. Sure. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Dawn, are you ready? Mm hmm. All right. First question Are you basically healthcare and education as your community's apostolate? Someone asked. Okay, we, well, um, our first apostolate is our perpetual adoration, but then our active apostolates are primarily education um, and healthcare. So, um, but we also have other ecclesial ministries too. So some of our sisters have worked in uh, ministry through the diocese, um, um, a, a lot of other things that maybe a bishop might ask us to do, but yes, primarily education and healthcare. Um, and there's a lot more to healthcare than people realize. Not <laughs> Not all of our sisters in the hospitals are nurses. Uh, there's a lot of spiritual care. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things to be done um, in a hospital. So, thank you. Someone was asking about the particular way that you have perpetual adoration, and asked why you aren't living cloister life. It's unique that you have such an apostolate of perpetual adoration. Can you tell us more a little bit about? Um, just why not cloistered and the uniqueness of that? I think it um, is really this unique gift of the Holy Spirit to our foundress. And she didn't see any separation between um, 
the perpetual adoration and the works of mercy. You know, um, we are adoring Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, and we carry those graces to the people we serve. And then we bring those people with us to our adoration and offer them to Jesus. Um, and I know for me, I the longer I'm here, the more I understand how both of those are so necessary um, and how they just, um, yeah, are, are seamless. And um, our mother founders has a quote about um, that it should just be one, that our life should be a ceaseless act of adoration, whether we're in the chapel or we're a nurse serving a patient or teaching first graders about first communion. Um, it can all be adoration of God. Beautiful. Thank you. Your joy is great. Thank you. <laughs> um, here's a fun question. How do you celebrate feast days or birthdays? What, what do celebrations look like in your community? Um, so for our birthday, our actu actually our greatest gift to our sister on her birthday is we have a mass intention celebrated for her on that day. Um, but, and we also, we usually sing to, uh, sing to our sisters and, you know, <laughs> rejoice that they're with us and it's a joyous occasion. But our name day is uh, our primary, our primary celebration. Um, you know, that name that the Lord kind of placed on our heart uh, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And um, yeah, the Come up with a lot of creative ways to to celebrate, um, decorating doors, singing. Um, maybe a sister receives like a special dessert on that day um, in her honor, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but especially the prayers of like remembering our patron. Um, That's good. Um, there's a lot of questions. We haven't addressed the question about health of a woman who's um, called to enter orders. We want to know. And women have asked a lot of different forms of like, if I have this, if I have this, you know, um, could you speak into the type of health that a woman needs to have for your particular community? And maybe if you could speak in a broader sense too for other communities, what they expect? Sure. So like in a broad sense, like um, the phrase kind of goes like a young woman should be of sound mind, body, and, and body to live community life. Um, so what that kind of means, yeah, community life isn't, a life of religious isn't, um, isn't easy. So um, we want to, uh, yeah, have all of like grace built on nature. So we want, um, we want the young woman to be set up for, um, to live her life fully and um, living out her consecration fully. Um, so, it's hard to make a blanket statement of like, you know, a young woman with this can't enter and a young woman with that can't enter. Uh, but I think there are um, some things like, yeah, there's a lot of uh, maybe serious cases of depression or serious cases of um, anxiety. Those are very prevalent in our culture. Um, and we think yeah, living a consecrated religious life with those um, those problems that aren't maybe healed, um, aren't taken care of, can make life very difficult for that person. And we want them to be, um, we want them to be happy and joyful and to be able to live this life. Um, and then, yeah, sound body, um, just walking and moving and taking care of oneself on their own, um, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, but for our particular community, we, yeah, we want to be in conversation with that young woman because, yeah, I can't say that, like, anyone who's ever experienced depression can never be a sister. I can't, like, that's not true because the Lord calls, calls people. So, yeah, what level of healing has someone received? Um, what, um, yeah, what tools do they have now? Are they capable of living in community life and participating in community life? Because in a marriage, you do have one other person that is attentive to, to you all the time um, and what you need. And in religious life, um, Jesus is that one person that's attentive to, to you all the time. And then your sisters in a secondary way are your support and we love each other and we are there for each other, um, but it is in a different way. So I don't know if that kind of anything. Yeah, and I'd say if the vocation is sincere, um, the Lord will make it happen. It might not be in the time or the manner that we think it should be, 
but um, nothing will stand in his way. Thank you. Um, some people want to know, how did you end up choosing or the Lord choosing you for like this particular charism, this apostolate, this particular order? Um, I don't know if all three of you want to mention something or just one of you want to mention something about how did God draw you to there? Like, how did you know? I think we can each like share a little, a little bit. Um, uh, for me, uh, the call to religious life and the call to our order just kind of came, was like all coming at the same time. Like I met our sisters while I was in college and once I met them, I, I saw that witness of joy and how much they loved Jesus. And then everything after that just didn't seem like worth it to me. <laughs> um, I was like, I was always comparing to those sisters and to perpetual adoration. And I, after the fact, after I had decided to enter and really felt like, yeah, a life without adoration and a, without um, our sisters, it was like, I belonged in, like in this family. Um, I realized, um, yeah, I, I didn't want to live without those things. And then I realized, um, yeah, my parents, they, uh, adoration had been a part of their, um, how they met, um, their spirituality as a couple. Even when I was young, um, our small little parish, like starting adoration. Um, so like, yeah, then realizing and giving thanks to God, like, yeah, adoration was a part of my life from the beginning. Um, so you want to share Sister Dorothy? Yes. Uh why I came here. My mom was a secular Franciscan. We had Franciscan priests in our parish. And um, I read the life of St. Francis in eighth grade and that touched my heart. In high school, I had our sisters. And so it was natural, they looked happy, they looked close to God. And that's, they were teachers. It was all what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so when I graduated from high school in May, then I entered in August. So I entered right after August and I would never, ever, ever have never regretted this because I love being a Franciscan that belongs to a Eucharistic congregation. Mm -hmm. Those two are so important for me. Beautiful. Dorothy, how old were you when you entered? I was 17. Oh. So <laughs> I was, I've been a sister now for 62 years. Oh. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful life. Yes. Not that there aren't difficult times, but it's a wonderful life. If God calls you here, he'll see that you make it through and that you grow and that you flourish and that you become holy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I would say similar things. Um, definitely just struck by the joy, the authentic joy of the sisters when I first met them. Um, and I think the Lord is continuing to teach me why he called me to this community. I didn't know much about St. Francis before I entered here. I don't think I could have spelled out the difference between Franciscan spirituality and like Dominican or something else. Um, but the more I learn about St. Francis and the more I get to know our sisters, the Lord knew what he was doing. Um, he knew that this is where he created me to be and how he created my heart to love within our community. Thank you. We did have a question that was in the chat regarding like the day in the life of, and I think there was a little bit of um, a dialogue about that, but do you want to briefly just mention kind of like the overarching structure of a day in the life of your community? Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, the two main well, three main pieces of we want to make sure our, our day starts and ends with prayer. Um, so most of these details are probably true for a lot of the communities. Um, ours might look a little different. So uh, on a regular weekday at the mother house, we are in chapel by 530 for meditation. So that time is just um, focusing and praying with scripture, preparing, usually preparing for uh, the that day's mass. So so we spend a half hour in meditation. And then at six o'clock, we have morning prayer, uh, the chanting of the liturgy of the, of the hours back and forth. Um, and then right directly following morning prayer that leads into the holy sacrifice of the mass. So we as sisters participate in the sacrifice of the mass together every day. And that's really what, um, 
yeah, gives us life, uh, connects us to each other, um, helps us um, live the rest of our day. Um, so then after uh, mass, then the sisters who are in an, an active apostolate, we have sisters who teach, who work at hospitals, who live at the mother house after mass, they usually, you know, grab a quick breakfast and then they go off to their apostolate for the day. Uh, and then our novices, our postulants, um, they have um, some cleaning work duties around the convent um, to help build that like constant conversation with Jesus. They don't have like huge responsibilities. And then, then they also have some classes throughout the day as well to learn our way of life. Um, we at the mother house also break during the middle of the day for midday prayer, the liturgy of the hours, um, and then gather for our um, our noon meal together. And then we, you know, each sister kind of then yeah, goes back to her work um, in the afternoon. And then in the evening, um, you know, our teachers, our, our sisters at the hospitals, all of us come back together for a holy hour um, in the evening. So the exposed blessed sacrament, and then we pray uh, our rosary together, evening prayer, liturgy of hours. And then we have benediction of the blessed sacrament. Um, and yeah, so then that concludes our community holy hour. And then we go to supper together and recreation. So a big part about being Franciscan is our family life. It's a fraternal life. Um, that's how we experience, um, yeah, how we share our joy that comes from the Eucharist. We share it with each other. Um, so yeah, so that's why we spend conscious time each day, enjoying each other's presence, um, having fun, sharing our day. Um, and then we end our day with night prayer. And then we usually try to go to bed early <laughs> because most of us are, you know, taking hours of adoration that night, or we had just taken an hour of adoration the night before. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, you know, staying healthy and awake and um, can, yeah, give Jesus all of our energy. Sister Dorothy, what's your favorite recommendation? <laughs> I like to play a dice game called Bomb Out. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty good. Her mental math is very good. <clears throat> I usually keep score. Yeah. And, but I don't cheat. They sometimes they'll accuse me of cheating. Oh, okay. I don't. Okay. <laughs> That's a good, that's a good overall question though, for all of you. What are the hobbies and the things that you guys do besides playing that game that Sister Dorothy just mentioned? <laughs> there are other games and cards they play. And then um, <clears throat> some sisters like to crochet and do needlework. And mm -hmm. then sometimes we just like to sing. We don't do that much, but we like to sing. And sometimes we have dance parties um, and Sister Ignatia was teaching me basketball this summer. Um, so sometimes we get outside. Um, really, uh, the best definition of community recreation I've heard is a bunch of sisters laughing together. Because that's basically what it is. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, we really only have about a minute for any other question. Um, so. If a woman wants to discern with your community, what is the best way she's to go about doing this? Right now, you probably don't have too many come and sees. I don't know what you have as a first step for a woman at this point, like, oh, I wanna go visit them or um, seek more into them. So I guess a, a first step is just um, reaching out through like our website, um, ssfpa.org. So there's a, a tab for vocations. We have a lot of like, you know, commonly asked questions on there, my contact information to contact the vocation director, inquiry form, something, yeah, something like that, just like an initial uh, contact. And then, um, and then I would be in contact with uh, the young woman just seeing like how I can support you, what questions you have. We can start, yeah, a dialogue about your discernment process. Um, and then more as things like progress more, we have been able to have very limited um, retreats like our last one was 10 people, but it was a very joyous uh, group of 10 people and they were able to come to our mother house. And then, um, so yeah, restrictions pending, hopefully yeah, in 2021, we'll be still be able to have a couple in-person retreats, um, limited spaces, obviously. Um, and then if, then if a woman has come on retreat, uh, been in contact with us, an active prayer life, all of those things and the Lord is still kind of drawing drawing her closer than 
and uh, you know then maybe we would try to see if um, a young woman could come on her own to see like our day to day life and just kind of join in in the day to day life and really just that way. Wonderful, thank you. It's beautiful to see all of your joy. Thank you for sharing your joy with us. All right, so we have a poll for you, everyone. Um, same poll as we've had the last few times. Uh, same questions, just with this different uh, community. So here we go. Uh, discerners, your number one, question number one. And those of you that are just curious about convent life, your question number two. Um, and we're so excited. These sisters have done a great job of showing us a, a around not only like physically around their convent, but sharing more about um, their Franciscan way of life and um, so much more about them. I'm just so thankful for all that they've shown us. So we're a uh, great job. Everybody finish up on the poll. Well, let's get to 70 something percent and then we'll stop the poll. Awesome, great. Look at everybody go. Thank you so much for that, everybody. It gives us some great feedback. Um, and I love the fact that so many of those curious about convent life, uh, sisters, 70% um, of them said that you have absolutely helped them understand more about religious life. So thank you so much for not only um, it's inspiring people who really want to know more. There are almost 40 discerners who want to know more about your particular community, but then we have so many who said you've helped them. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm not exactly sure uh, at which one is so uh, more important. Honestly, it's so great. Both of those things is, is um, are important. So we're so thankful. So um, thank you for that. And we want to say thank you, everybody, right? Don't we want to say thank you to the sisters? Everybody, give you some, give you some love, give a thumbs up show your reactions. We are so thankful for you, sisters. God bless you all, thank you. And we'll see some of you tonight at our discerner hour. So for those of you who really desire to revisit these sisters in our discerning hour, please take note of that, the Franciscans. You can just put Franciscans in, in that part of the night. So blessings sisters, we'll see you in a couple hours. And God bless you. Bye. All right. You've been through the third convent. Nice job, you guys. Hang in there. We're doing good. <laughs> um, blessings on our discernment with this community. This is the Franciscans, the Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration. And it's always important to like remember the whole name because there's so many different Franciscans. There's so many different Benedictines and the varieties of communities. So um, we're glad to have these sisters and their unique charism. So we're gonna just take a minute to just recollect just a couple minutes. So take a few breaths and just rest with the Lord. We invite you Holy Spirit. Give us your wisdom and insight. And thank you for blessing us with the joy of the Franciscans. We ask you, Lord, show us anything that you wish about this community that moved us in some way or another. I ask you to bring that to our minds right now. There was a uniqueness that you saw in what the sisters lived by their very example and their sharing, their stories, from the younger sisters to the older ones. You think through their chapel, their adoration,
and sometimes the Lord's awakens a new desire for someone to um, now desire a community that has perpetual adoration. Um, this might be something that is a part of your charism of your heart. So we just think of that. Anything about their ministry, their apostolate? Some of them are teachers and some of them are in healthcare. From the very young to the college students, I think. And we even think of how they are interacting with their family who is on this um, session with us, was on this session with us, um, the uniqueness of that. Let me take one last 30 seconds or so to just anything else God wants to show you. Anything else, Lord, you want us to, sh to know about this community for our hearts? We thank you, Lord, for all that you're, you've done and all of you're yet to do. Bless that community of Franciscans and bless each of us as we continue to discern. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Dawn, for that. Um, I also